first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure. Um, for a very practical reason, I couldn't be here this morning, so I apologize if everything I'm saying is you just, you know, you already solve all these problems, just let me know and we can, <laughs> we can just stop. Um, all right, so, so this is research that myself, Martin Krovsky, and many others at JPL, Caltech, UCLA, many other places have been doing over the last two, 20 years, more. Um, I'll start with this slide. And I'm sure all of you have seen some incarnation of this figure, right? So this is, this is from the latest IPCC, but it's the typical time series of global mean surface temperature anomaly. So the difference against a certain period over there, this is observations really, or models through past and present climate, and then you have predictions. And there's two things here, right, that everybody highlights. One, of course, is that the different colors represent different scenarios, so basically different amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, so trying to predict the world and the economy and everything. Um, and of course, the differences are enormous, but even within sort of, let's say, the, the red line, let's say the red line is a plausible scenario, even within the same plausible scenario, when you have 25 models from a variety of different organizations around the world, you still have a huge amount of variability, right? So you have models that will predict that in about 80 years we'll have warming of three degrees Celsius and others six degrees Celsius. Now this is often, um, and again, you all know this very well, related or associated with clouds. But not always it's clear what does it mean when it says it's associated with clouds. And, and Harakawa kind of summarized it very nicely. It was a very nice um, symposium uh, about Akio Arakawa two weeks ago, and um, he summarized it very nicely almost 40 years ago, and he's talking about parameterization in this report, and he says, well, a cloud is a product of all these different things, right? So there's turbulence, there's convection, there's cloud microphysics, there's large scale, there's radiation, short wave, long wave. There's a variety of things, right? And so what I'll spend most of the time today is talking about the relation between clouds, turbulence, and convection and how the two go together and what the sort of fundamental problems are and how you can tackle them, address them. And, and then in the end, I have a bunch of questions that are completely unresolved. Now, this is just a very basic perspective from a very pragmatic perspective. Why is it that global atmospheric models, both weather and climate, need clouds? Because by the way, most of the atmospheric models didn't really have, I mean, weather prediction models only started to have some sort of interactive clouds in the mid 80s for global atmospheric models. So they did it because of precipitation. That's sort of the number one thing people wanna know if it's gonna to rain tomorrow. So it really is a product of, a key product of the model, maybe the number one. We know that vertical transport is terribly influenced by buoyancy and buoyancy related to phase transition. So we know that if we want to represent vertical transport, we need to be able to represent some of these key aspects of clouds. And of course, from a climate perspective, what else is more important than clouds in the atmosphere, right? The amount and sort of the intensity and the significance of the interaction between clouds and radiation is so large in the climate system that, that models need to have it, of course. Now, the atmosphere, as again, you all know and been discussing is a, is a, is a fluid in, in, in a turbulent flow, but it has mixed phase physics and it has interaction with radiation. So that demands that we are able to parameterize and represent in these large scale models, they have big grid boxes. You know, you need to represent radiation, short wave and long wave. We need to represent boundary layer turbulence, convection, uh, gravity waves, interaction with the surface and clouds in a variety of different processes related to clouds. Now, this is a nice figure that is inspired by an original one from Arakawa that then was changed by Bjorn Stevens. And then this is sort of the final official version of, of the figure from the IPCC. And you can think of it as a transition, sort of a cross section from, let's say, Santa Barbara, right? So this is the coast of California, stratocumulus off the coast. And as you go close to Hawaii, you have less subsidence, warmer waters, then you have shallow convection. And then in the deep tropics, you have deep convection. And what happens in most, if well, not all of our models, and I mean both weather and climate prediction models from a global perspective, you often have modules, different subroutines, different algorithms, different pieces of code that actually represent this different sort of mixing. So 
about 20 years ago, ECMWF, for example, would have two different modules for stable boundary layer, one for the dry convective boundary layer. Stratocumulus mixing was in a completely different part of the code. Shallow convection was another one and so on. So one of the goals of our research, or I would say the key goal of the research of a few groups around the world has been to actually come up with sort of unified or integrated parameterizations for turbulence and convection. It's a variety of groups, by the way. Um, and so wh wh what do you mean when we talk about parameterization of turbulence and convection? Well, you can summarize it in a very simple way by saying that when you basically need to do averaging because, you know, physics, as you <laughs> been describing happens at very small scales, um, but the grid boxes for a general sort of general circulation model, even today is between 50 to 100 kilometers. For a global weather prediction is better, it's about 10, but, but ECM graph is nine, but it's not better than that. So you actually, when you do Reynolds decomposition and averaging, let's say on a thermodynamic variable or, or a passive tracer or whatever you want to put on the source and sink, you end up with something that looks exactly like this, right? So you will have in spherical uh, geometries. You have an Eulerian tendency then of the mean, then you basically have sort of the advection of the mean, and then you have sources and sinks depending on the variable. And in the end, for the atmosphere, it's different from the ocean, for example, what do you really talk about when you talk about terminus and convection is how do you represent the vertical divergence of this subgrid scale uh, flow, right? So this is the covariance between vertical motion, vertical velocity, and the perturbation of that particular variable. Now, one of the tools, or the tool that we use all the time to try to help us develop, and you know again this well, is large eddy simulation. In large eddy simulation, these are models that basically solve, solve filtered versions of the Navier-Stokes equations, but the key part, the key component of this story is that you can solve them in small domains, right? In this case, we solve it in a domain of 20 by 20 kilometers in the horizontal. Because of that, we can actually use very high resolutions, right? So, so you, we can actually resolve in many respects 80, 90 percent of the turbulence that exists. Of course, we don't resolve the cloud microphysics, and that's a different story that you will be talking about. If you look at this image, it's actually difficult to, to believe that this is not a photograph taken. I mean, I, I guess a very nice smooth surface will trigger a, a suspicion, but these clouds look very real, as you can see. So LDS really play a fundamental role in what we do. Now let's start with convective boundary layers and let's start with the simplest case of a convective boundary layer. So forget clouds for the moment, forget phase transitions. When you have imagined you're you know, over the desert, this is summer, the sun is shining, warms the surface, and then you start to have these eddies that are sort of transporting energy above. And basically this is an LES simulation. Your potential temperature structure, the mean potential temperature structure would evolve like this, right? So you start with sort of a, a very stable boundary layer, let's say during the night, in the morning, and then as the surface starts to warm, the boundary layer starts to get warmer and warmer, and it basically stays very well mixed and basically grows to entrainment. And if you simplify the entire problem, your thermodynamic equation will look like this. If you assume homogeneity in the horizontal, you know, a bunch of stuff, you basically end up with something like this. If you assume that your water vapor is so small that really doesn't play a big role in terms of radiation interaction and there's no phase transition, then these are the two equations you have to solve. They're very simple, and yet, although they're very simple, the models even today can do these things very well. They can do this counter gradient flux, which is basically the flux or the flow that exists because eddies, large eddies go against the mean gradient, and it doesn't do PVL top entrainment very well. So even the simplest convective problem you can imagine, global atmospheric models, both for weather and climate, can do a very good job. When you come into the sort of cloud world, the phase transition world, then you can start with equations like the ones on the top, which is sort of the basic equations that people started with when they started to do cloud modeling. This is in the 1960s. You have an equation for the mean. Here, by the way, all of these quantities are means that just don't have the, the bar. Um, you have a mean potential temperature equation, mean water vapor, mean liquid water. But <clears throat> there are a few problems with trying to solve this on the mean. And one way to address this issue, and this came up uh, probably from the beginning of the sort of boundary layer studies done by Diodorf and others, uh, was to actually come up with moist conserved variables to simplify the system of equations. So moist conserved variables will be variables that don't change 
when you have phase transitions, when you have evaporation or condensation. If you have precipitation, then it's not the same story. But then you simplify all those equations to just two equations on liquid water potential temperature and total water content. And there's a couple of very pragmatic, very practical advantages when you're doing this. Not only you basically you know, end up with d something dt equals to zero, which is very convenient, but when you're actually integrating this from a parameterization perspective, your cloud condensation term C basically disappears from the equations. And this term C is not an issue if you're actually looking at infinitesimal quantities, both in time and space, you can solve it. But when you're averaging over boxes of 100 by 100 kilometers, you don't really know what to do with that term. You don't really know how to build, construct that term. Now, another thing is that when you use any diffusivity approach, for example, to represent the fluxes, if you try to solve that, using any diffusivity, you will get the wrong fluxes for the cloud water. They will go in the wrong direction. So doing this allows you to address these two issues. It also kind of creates the situation where to keep thermodynamic consistency, you actually can detect, can basically estimate the cloud fraction in the mean cloud water using PDFs, as, I, as I'll show you, that are associated with this uh, statistics. Now, so, I've showed you this slide here for the dry convective boundary layer, the simple system of equations. When you go, and of course, all of this you know very well, but I'm just trying to explain to you where we are in terms of our parameterization in climate models and weather models. When you basically go to moist convective boundary layers, and this now is the evolution over different SSTs of, of um, cloudy convective boundary layers over the subtropics, don't worry about the details. I can talk about them if you want later. But basically, when you go into sort of the phase transition world, when you go to mixed phase, you need not only these sort of moist conserved variables to simplify the system of equations, you also need two additional variables to look at the problem from a different angle. Now, your, your dry boundary layer is not dry anymore, so, so, so and, and water vapor and liquid water play a role, so now your buoyancy needs to, you need a different temperature variable to estimate your buoyancy, and that's the virtual potential temperature. On the other hand, you also need a variable that kind of tells you how far you are from saturation. And this is relative humidity, which is a very convenient and practical variable and intuitive in many respects. So basically, the ratio between the amount of water vapor you have in the atmosphere and how much water vapor you, you need before you uh, saturate. So this particular variable over here has played a very important role in the development of the first cloud cover parameterizations. So I have a slide at the end that I, I I could show you if you have time, but or I can show you on the side, that shows you that the first, you know, first climate modeling work done by Tsuki Manabe, for example, and others, who, by the way, won the, the, the Nobel Prize about a year ago, they, they, they just impose the clouds. So you have a climate and they impose the clouds. They say, okay, I, I don't know how to calculate the clouds, I'm going to impose the clouds. And, and, and the results were really nice, but um, profound, but, but they still impose the clouds. So the first attempt to come up with ways of calculating what the cloud cover would be. So basically, if you have a box of 100 by 100 kilometers, you know that the cloud is not going to be 0 or 1, right? It's going to be somewhere between 0 and 1. So the first assumptions were made, and this is still taking place. I mean, there's still models using this, but started in the 60s, 70s, um, is this idea that you can calculate the cloud cover fraction as a function of the mean relative humidity. And you have a variety of different sort of incarnations. They all kind of look the same, a quadratic function starting at the critical value. But you, you, you don't have to go very far, but to look at some uh, observations of, let's say, both the cloud fraction and relative humidity, look at the histogram and how they are distributed. You can see that in this case, for this particular paper in this it's a field experiment, they end up having, as you would expect, some sort of big, a uh, blob in the histogram close to almost no clouds and around the mean relative humidity of the situation, and then a big sort of blob over there. But if you try to do the average, it doesn't really reflect very much because most of the points are over here, over here. There isn't much over there. So because of that, over the last few decades, there's been, and all of this is very slow, right? So the progress in climate modeling not necessarily what people do in between, but in operational versions, both in climate and weather modeling, in terms of clouds, it's very, very slow. We're talking in terms of decades. One of the ideas that was first discussed in the mid 70s and published in 77, and actually a couple of papers in 75, is this idea of using the moist conserved variables. So if you use these variables over here, the moist conserved variables, and they are obviously associated with the distribution of those variables inside the box. 
you can, and this is just an example, this is basically a cut, this is a large eddy simulation model, this is a shallow convection case. You look at the PDF or histogram that you obtain of theta L and uh, QT total water, this is the saturation line, and you can clearly see that this distribution that the LDS has is a bunch of points above the saturation line, which are the ones inside the cloud, and most of the points in this case are actually outside, in the dry area of the phase space, and they sort of clear sky. But by definition, your cloud fraction and your mean liquid water are going to be sort of the, these moments of the distribution. So it's just the integral from QS. I'm just doing this in total water. This is, of course, better done in both temperature and, and, and water space, but it's easier to understand if you do it like this, uh, because I don't have to come up with a new variable. So if you look at the problem, if you integrate the probability of the total water from QS, the saturation value to infinity, you collect the cloud cover. And if you look at this difference, you get the mean liquid water. If in the end you say, well, my PDF is actually a gauche and you simplify the entire process, you end up with very simple expressions for cloud cover and liquid water that are a function of this big Q variable, which is basically nothing else than the mean total water minus the mean saturation divided by the variance of the distribution. Now this variance of the Gaussian distribution or other, other more complicated moments of the distribution will of course be dependent on how much turbulence and convection there is. If, if there is no turbulence, this variance is very small. If there's a lot of turbulence, it's very wide. So let's, let's go into the turbulence part of the story. And so the way, so, so this is the main quantity you need to calculate when you're talking about turbulence and convection, right? It's the vertical mixing, the subgrid vertical mixing, the mixing that your model cannot resolve. Basically, the idea of any diffusivity is very, very old. It's as old as an obvious Stokes equation in practice. It's much older than, than Reynolds. Um, the idea here is to basically say that all of this turbulent mixing is proportional to the mean gradient. And this is actually fairly successful and exists in every climate model and every weather model. It's very successful in doing things like stable boundary layers, not extremely stable, but fairly stable boundary layers, and sort of the surface layer and mixing and momentum and so on. But it really doesn't do a very good job in convective boundary layers. And for convective boundary layers, people have started to use S parameterization, mostly for moist convection, mostly for moist deep convection in the beginning. And again, the first person to actually do this in terms of parameterization was Arakawa, was to use this idea of plumes or, or thermal. So, so here the, it starts with a paper by Stommel, oceanographer, as you know, in the 40s, in the late 40s. I think there's an older paper than this. And the idea is, let's imagine that most of the flow that happens um, in this sort of subgrid scales is actually taking place in these plumes, right? So if you model these plumes, if you come up with a model of the plumes, then you can actually kind of solve the problem. And so one, um, one approach that we follow in this idea of sort of unified or integrated parameterizations was to sort of bring together those two so, sort of different worlds, the diffusivity that comes from the turbulence community and, and this mass flux that I'll have, show you another slide about comes from the convection world. And so in practice, you can actually go back to very simple basic definitions. If you divide first your grid box in an area that is going up, we call it the updraft, and then the remaining of, of, of the atmosphere is coming down, then if you do then Reynolds decomposition and averaging, your flux, your sort of turbulent flux end up being three different quantities. The first quantity on the right is basically the amount of turbulence that exists inside those updrafts, inside those plumes. And AU is just the area in the grid box that is occupied by all these different plumes. Then next is the amount of turbulence that exists in the environment around it. So, so it's not in the plumes, it's like sort of often the dry environment around it. And then the last term is basically about the exchange of properties between both the plumes and the environment. Now, if you, in addition, simplify the problem to say that your updraft area is small and we can debate that, but this is mostly for pedagogical terms, you basically end up with two terms here. The, the, the subgrid scale flux is a function of the amount of turbulence that exists in the environment plus this, what we call the mass flux, which is just the multiplication, the, uh, the difference between the properties inside the updraft and the mean times the amount of momentum that exists in those plumes, times the area that is occupied. So in the end, if you actually assume that you can use diffusivity for this one, you keep the other one, you call it the mass flux, and if you actually integrate this all together from the beginning, so you end up having a parameterization that is able to represent both the small scale and the large scale eddies at the same time. So this comes from, you know, 
it's the code is shared and the algorithm and everything. This is uh, just one illustration again from an LES model of why this is actually important. And I'll have a, one last one uh, uh, in a couple of slides. But if you do the same thing here, if you do a cut in the horizontal, let's say about a kilometer above the surface or inside the part that has clouds, and you look at the distribution of the points in terms of vertical velocity and the amount of total water, so vapor plus liquid minus the mean, you end up having this sort of uh, distribution that basically has two sides, right? So it's really a Gaussian distribution around the environmental mean and then sort of the quieter part of the, of, of the atmosphere. And then this very active part of the atmosphere where there's a lot of action going on where the vertical velocities are very high and the amount of water is very high that needs to be represented by the mass flux. Because in the end, what the mass flux is doing from a very simple intuitive way is that the mass flux is representing these sort of larger plumes of the depth of the vertical, either the boundary layer or the, or the troposphere, while the diffusivity is doing these sort of smaller plumes around it. Now, in terms of the mass flux, often what people do to obtain the terms is just you, you, you come up with this. You, so you have this idea that I want to come up with a model to represent the physics of this sort of regions. So if you integrate over these plume areas, right, so, so you don't have to specify how they look like, if you assume steady state and neglect some sources and sinks, you end up with a system of equations that is relatively simple to integrate. So you have for properties like the moist conserved variables, let's say the L and QT, you have this sort of entraining plume model where this lateral entrainment, so this is not the top entrainment, but the lateral entrainment sort of, co sort of controls the mixing between the plumes and the environment. And then you have a fairly similar equation for the amount for the kinetic energy or the momentum that the only fundamental difference is that it has a buoyancy source. So, so this phase transition generates buoyancy that basically makes these plumes very active and very energetic. Now an approach that following this, so we started this about 20 years ago, over the last 10 years or so, uh, we have followed an approach that involves the existence of multiple plumes, several plumes in a particular grid box. So what we do first is to sort of sample the surface layer properties of the thermodynamic variables and, and the vertical velocity. Um, if the, a particular plume is already fairly energetic from the beginning, it will have a tendency to go further. While this happened, at the same time, we also have some stochastic entrainment parameterization, partly inspired by Romps and Quang, that basically tells you how often a particular plume is going to face uh, encounter an entraining event. And so if some of the plumes not only are energetic from the beginning, but don't face a lot of entrainment, then they will go very far, others will not. The critical aspect of this entire story or this approach is that the idea that different types of convection can actually coexist in the same grid box. So traditionally, and parameterizations of convection and boundary layer, they tend to be sort of sequential, sequential and they will have triggers that will move them from or thresholds, move them from one type of convection to another and all of that. And that's the reason why we wanted to bring it all together. With this type of approach, basically you're allowed to have, you know, some of the plumes will just do dry mixing, others will be shallow convection, others will be deep convection, sort of the atmosphere allows it to be the case. So I'll show you just one or two quick results of this. Um, this is uh, a shallow convection case. Um, this sort of think of this pop, you know, popcorn, puffy popcorn clouds. I'm just going to show you the vertical profiles of updraft properties. So these are multiple plumes and, and then you're looking at the LES averages and this sort of EDMF averages of the multiple plumes. The first one is this updraft fraction area, this AU. The other one is the vertical velocity and the other one is the updraft liquid water content. Uh, the LES sort of range, these are different LESs. This is the range between the different LES and the colors are sort of different realizations of this EDMF multiple plume approach. And what you can see is that in the end, the sort of the multiple plumes seem to fit the distributions of updraft properties really well. Um, if you actually look at the mean values of the thermodynamic variables that I'm not showing, you won't see a difference. And the reason is because the updraft properties are very well represented. A reason why in the end, you are able to sort of intuitively understand why these multiple plumes are doing a good job uh, can be seen in this diagram. So in this one, we do very much the same thing at about a thousand meters above the surface in the middle of the convective uh, layer. We look at the LES joint PDF of liquid water potential temperature minus the mean. 
and total water minus the mean, and you see this nice, very skewed distribution that contains a very sort of very populated Gaussian region in the environment, but then there is this very skewed part of the distribution where all of the action is taking place, where you actually have these energetic plumes. And what you can see is that the multiple plumes from the EDMF parameterization seem to match that region very well. So what this says is that this sort of discrete model that we are using to represent this convection is actually able to capture the sort of kind of highly skewed part of the distribution. Now, one final topic about the convection and, and, and uh, unified boundary layer convection scheme is this idea of trying to extend it. Because in the end, what we want to do, we want to do all types of convection, not just the boundary layer and the shallow convection and stratocumulus. By the way, I, I have other results for stratocumulus that I could show. But also we want to do the deeper convection, which is a much, much more difficult problem to solve. And one, one sort of good demonstration of, of the fact that models struggle in representing not only deep convection, but the transitions from different types of convection. Uh, this is this schematic from, from a paper, a uh, nice paper from Francoise Guichard almost 20 years ago, in which she compares what explicit models, which are cloud resolving models or LES, do in terms of the transition of convection and rain over the Amazon, and what often the, she calls them single column models, but these are single column versions of climate and weather models, are able to do. And what you can see is that this sort of nice transition that starts from sort of a, a stable boundary layer in the morning, dry convection, then shallow convection, then maybe some congestions, and then rain in the evening is not at all what the models can do. And, and most models, I would say all models, even today, and I've been working with the NCAR model in particular, still do this very poorly, in which they basically explode in terms of deep convection hours, several hours earlier than they should. What we tried to do then to represent this was to bring a very, very simple parameterization of uh, microphysics inside the plumes, and then some very simple parameterization of downdrafts and what we called cold plumes as well. And what we want to show you here is just the fact that using just one single scheme, we are actually able to uh, basically represent this transition. And this is the transition in time of both the cloud base and the cloud top. So this is the base where these big cumulus convection, convection clouds are, and these are the different sort of, this is the mean cloud top. The LES is in red, and then EDMF is in, sorry, EDMF is in red, LES is in black. And you can see that the EDMF, so this idea of multiple plumes associated with diffusivity, is actually able to represent this transition. And this is a, I think the first time that we actually are able to represent with a single parameterization all of these different uh, types of convection. Now, before I finish, and I have my last two slides have questions for discussion if, if, if you want to or, or not. But before that, um, I didn't talk about cloud microphysics because I'm not a cloud microphysics um, expert. Um, but one of the things I've worked over the years was in this idea of how do you actually, how do you couple this, you know, everything we learn from the turbulence side? and all the developments that we have made. How do you actually couple that with the cloud parameterization itself? Now, forget the precipitation even for the moment. If you want to determine only the cloud fraction and the mean liquid water and the, and the mean ice content, you have very different approaches today. And they're, they're completely opposite, right? They, they don't really share a lot in common. So, so if you use the moist conserved variables, and you have these PDFs that have basically the variability associated with the amount of turbulence and convection, then by definition, your cloud cover and your liquid water can be calculated like this, and, and you have sort of a closed system of equations. On the other hand, uh, many uh, cloud models and cloud parameterizations have evolved to calculate uh, prognostic variables like the mean liquid water, mean ice, precipitation, snow, and, and even others. And there is no communication between the two. There is very little information about the amount of turbulence that's sort of being entrained into the development of these schemes and, and, and vice versa as well. So there should be a coupling and there should be communication between the two, right? So this is just one example of, of many that I could show. I selected to show you this one from a paper by Michael Titke because he introduced for the first time in that paper Another prognostic equation for cloud fraction, which is sort of still uncommon, but, but exists. There are several climate models 
that right now in weather models that have prognostic equations for cloud fraction, which is sort of odd in itself, in a way, right? Because this is not a continuous quantity, right? If you go to infinitesimal DDTs and DDXs and DDYs, this quantity disappears. So this is a major open challenge. Right now, I would say from our, my perspective, this is the biggest, this is the biggest next step that we need to be able to take. And it's not clear at all what the answer to this is. So let me summarize and then show you one last slide. I talked about basically the connection between turbulence convection and clouds. I avoided going into the cloud cover problem of liquid water and the ice because we still don't know what the solution is. But there's a lot of other things that were not solved in the last 20 years that we managed to solve. We use EDMF to do a bunch of these things and, and do them well. So we're getting very close to unified parameterizations of turbulence and convection. We are, however, very far from actually being able to couple them well with the cloud parameterization itself. Not only the microphysics, but even what people call the macrophysics. Now let me let me give you this leave you this slide. We can discuss anything you want. You can ask whatever question, of course. But I wanted to go back to the beginning. I wanted to go back to the climate prediction problem, right? So we keep having, so this, this distance between the different models and how much the atmosphere or the planet will warm if you would say double the amount of CO2. This has been here for the last 40 years. It hasn't changed. And there's been a lot of work, uh, not only in terms of making these climate models better, but also looking at, um, you know, paleoclimate uh, data, looking at, you know, current observations. And this sort of divergence, this variability, this, I don't know what you want to call it, this uncertainty, doesn't seem to go away. So there's broad questions we can think about, and, and they all sort of related to clouds in a way, right? So the first question is, are this sort of, the approach that we've been following over the last 50 years is to basically run global atmospheric models that use for numerical weather prediction in climate mode. The difference is in terms of physics and dynamics between climate models and weather models is very small. There's probably more differences between two randomly, uh, you know, two random weather models than between weather models and climate models in general. So the approach has been since the 1960s, let's run these global atmospheric models that are so successful in weather prediction in climate projections and hope that this is the way to do it because we're trying to really represent the physics of the atmosphere. That may not be the optimal approach. We just don't know. I mean, it would be great if it was. Well, I don't know if it would be great. It would be comforting if it was, kind of. Because if it isn't, then, then, then it's a bit of a bummer. And, and, and actually, if you think about why weather prediction models have been so successful, it's actually something very simple. In the 1980s, when really the first sort of 10-day predictions of weather were made, I mean, it started in 1979, but let's say in the middle of 1980s, the computer resources that the centers had were good enough to resolve the baroclinic systems of the atmosphere in winter. So all these frontal systems. And for most people that were working on this, the key question they wanted to answer was, is it going to rain in London or Paris or Washington DC in five days time? Turns out that you can answer that question very well right now. But mostly because our computers were in the 1980s already good enough to resolve the baroclinic systems that are too big. But not like this in the ocean, right? So it's rather fortuitous in the, in the end that we're so successful because if we want to know when is the fog going to lift here in summer, at what time, the predictions are terrible. We can't really do that very well. Now, it could also be that's a natural uncertainty that we can't really overcome. I mean, it may be that the atmosphere and climate system is that sensitive that we don't know if at some stage the clouds really going to decrease by 1%. We, we just don't know. Maybe it's, it's there. And then finally, even if this is the right approach, how much detail do we actually need? And, and I think this is a community that is really at the right place. Well, plenty of time. Um, this is a community that's really at the right place to answer this question, right? Because you managed to bring people from all sides of, of the problem from a geophysics perspective and, and, and maybe think about it from the very, very, very small scale to the very large scale what is the level of detail that we need to represent cloud processes to be able to answer the question of how much is the globe going to warm in 80 years time? The final question for me is how well do climate models reproduce the current climate? Because often, and that may sound surprising, climate models are not sort of 
tuned, and I don't want to use tuned in the bad sense of the word, but in the good sense of the word, they're not calibrated to necessarily represent the current climate well. They're calibrated to be stable if you don't increase the CO2. That's how they're calibrated. And the consequence of that is a nice figure that you rarely see, but it's in a paper by Bjorn Stevens and Schwartz from about 10 years ago. So often, this is my last slide, often what you see is the temperature anomaly. So, so if I go back to this slide, this is sort of the variability of the models, right, around this value, and it seems spectacularly good. The models seem to fit the observations really well, and this is, you know, I don't think these are the observations, but the observations will look very nice compared to this, and all seems to be great until now that, you know, in the future everything splits up and goes in its direction. But if you actually, instead of plotting the anomaly of the global surface temperature, and maybe many of you have done so, if you actually plot the global mean surface temperature, not the anomaly, this is how much the models diverge between them, each other. This is a bunch of CMIP3 models, and there's no reason to believe that CMIP6 is different. This is how much they diverge. Now, you can clearly see that they have the right progression, and they seem to respond to climate change and to the increase of greenhouse gases very well, or at least similarly. But they are in completely different planets because a planet that produces a 12 degrees Celsius mean value of global mean surface temperature, another one that produces over 15, they're not exactly the same planet. So anyway, I'll leave you with the previous one maybe if you want to talk about this or anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Time for questions. Or answers? Answers would be great, yeah. Thank you for an illuminating um, and historical perspective on what, what has been discovered there. Um, when I'm thinking of the log law of the wall that you mentioned in your presentation and, and the interaction with convective rules, etc., I think of the Monon Obukov uh, uh, closure, which includes, uh, which involves stability or instability. Has this theory been completely de uh, abandoned, or is it, wh why is it that we don't have, or is it just because it's on a much smaller scale next to the ground? Monon Obukov is there. Monon Obukov is in most weather and climate prediction models. It's your boundary condition. So it, it Monon Obukov is here. Right? In a way, I just take out the stability. Um, yeah, Monin Nobukov is adding diffusivity and it's there. I think most of the models right now will have it as the surface layer description, and then your boundary condition is associated with that surface layer. Um, thanks, Zhao. I, I, uh, one of the themes that we had this morning was emergent properties of cloud systems. And, uh, you know, the fact that we can probably exploit some of these emergent properties. And something that came to mind in seeing your EDMF with the multiple plumes is that you might be able to get a cloud size distribution from multiple plumes. And we know something about cloud size distributions. I mean, they're widely observed and, and quantified. And so I just wondered if there's a way of trying to use that as a central constraint, let's say, on convective schemes, because that's going to reduce your number of degrees of freedom. So we, we, don't, we, we, we don't use them in the development of our parameterization. Rule Nagers from the University of Cologne that you, you may know, has a parameterization in which he uses uh, the cloud size distributions yeah. and their multiple yeah. plumes. Um, so, so there's a lot that can be done to, to improve what we've done and others have done it. The other part of the question that you had, I, if, I, if I understood it correctly, is can we actually use this simple, because this, you know, parameterizations, we call them parameterizations, they're nothing else than simple models of reality, right? Basically, these are models of, like Moni Nobukov, these are models of, you know, the statistics of turbulence close to the surface for Moni Nobukov. Um, 
So can we use simple models? Can we use multiple plume models and use that to understand what sort of size distributions should be there instead of using just more complex models like LES? So, so can we use these parameterizations as mechanisms to understand rather than just plug it into the model and, and let the model run? Yeah. I think so, but I, I don't know. I would not know from the top of my head how to do it, but I, I believe that one of the things I would like to explore is how do you actually go from these simple models into understanding better the atmosphere? Because that's what the terminus community has done forever, right? I mean, people have used these models like Moni Nobukov and others to understand turbulence in the atmosphere, right? So hopefully we'll be able to do that. Um, anyway, th those are yeah. the two answers. And perhaps while I'm up here, I'll just ask one quick uh, question. You mentioned this improvement in predictability. Uh, you know, being able to get these right. sort of five, ten day yeah. uh, predictions. And you mentioned the, uh, you know, more compute power, but I, I wonder to what extent you think that's uh, also a question of the data simulation and just huge amounts of data that are being so, uh, ingested into these systems. Okay, so, so the explanation I gave is the explanation that if someone, you know, is the, what do you call in the US the elevator speech, right? If you if you're in the elevator with the CEO of the company and, and he or she asks you a question, how can you answer that before getting to the top floor? Um, I think if, if, you know, my sons would ask me why is weather prediction so successful, the first answer is just because we're lucky, because the baroclinic systems in, in winter in the atmosphere are big enough so that our computers, our electronics, our whatever, solid state physics was advanced enough in the 1980s to solve it. Otherwise, it would not be the case. Now, it is true that from the 1990s to today, but mostly you can see it from the 90s, 1990s to maybe the mid 2000s, the availability of new satellite data completely changes the game in the Southern Hemisphere. So in the Northern Hemisphere, the balloons were used to be good enough to basically initialize the model. Okay, there were no balloons over the Atlantic and the North Pacific, but there were a lot of radio sounds along the way. But the southern hemisphere was really in bad shape. And, and when GPS radio occultation, microwave sounders, and infrared hyperspectral sounders came in with sophisticated data simulation methodologies that were developed in the 90s and implemented in the 90s, like variational data simulation, that made a big difference. But in the southern hemisphere, I, if you look at the difference in the southern hemisphere, it's enormous. It's days. You go from being able to predict something in two days to be able to predict the same thing in five days in advance. The difference is not that big in the Northern Hemisphere. So I think it's resolution and then data simulation. What, what, one, one interesting, in a very practical sense, ECMWF started doing coupled ocean atmosphere modeling in the early 90s. And the idea, if, if, if you're old enough to remember, in the late 80s when El Nino became, well, El Nino becomes really popular in the mid 80s, late, early 80s, I think. But then in the, in the middle to late 80s, there are some simple models that seem to allow us to think that if we couple the ocean and the atmosphere, we'll be able to nail El Nino. And ECMWF was one of the first to do this, and they started doing it in the early 1990s. And even today, I don't think anyone can claim that those nine months predictions from anyone are reliable. So we still don't know exactly what is it that, that doesn't allow us to predict El Nino very well several months in advance. So there's something there. And this is an example that it's, sometimes a lot of the things are just fortuitous, right? We're just lucky to have the right equations. Of course, there's the right equations, right? You need to have the right equations. They were developed before the 1980s. But, um, but yeah, so that, that's sort of a long answer to your question. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Okay, maybe a question for me. Uh, you briefly mentioned microphysics. I'm kind of wondering, uh, seeing the progress in the subgrid scale modeling, uh, where do you see the progress for the, or where do you fit the cloud microphysics there? I think we need to work we, on that. Do we need it? Do we don't need it? <laughs> no, I mean, so I, 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 I'm not a cloud microphysicist, so, so I rely on you and, and, and others. I think we need to make sure, I don't even know where to start, because <laughs> if you look, if you read papers like Morrison Gettleman, for example, right? And I have so many questions, not only out of my ignorance, okay, those are, <laughs> those are many, but even out of, 
they use subgrid variability. They spend like a page of the paper praising the importance of subgrid variability. And then they virtually don't use it because nobody knows how to really use this. So some people are doing things, there's no question. But I don't know, I mean, if you go back to these equations, how do you? I mean, that's a subgrid scale variability even in the yeah. LES, right? Right, so this is one approach. This is another one. They're completely different. How do you, I mean, this is where we got. This is where Theodorf and Lily took us. And this is somehow where, well, this part is where Michael Titke took us, but this is sort of where cloud modeling, starting in the 60s, took us. Just not been a lot of communication. Maybe we need more meetings like this for people to sort of sit down and spend time thinking about it. I mean, just deriving what are the right set. Of, last, last point. Look at that. Most models don't use most conserved variables. Most, if not all, global weather and climate models use potential temperature or dry static energy. The entire community that does boundary layer, or most of it, uses conserved variables. We don't even know, we don't have an agreement on what's the right temperature variable for the first law of thermodynamics in your model. We don't know what the right one is, or at least we haven't come up with any sort of agreement. And that's a statement of how behind we are, I guess, in a way. So just sitting down and deriving what the right equation should be, advantage, disadvantage, all of that, it's something we haven't done, or if we have, we haven't reached any conclusion. More questions, or should we finish with this dramatic statement? <laughs> traumatic or dramatic? Dramatic. Traumatic. <laughs> it's traumatic. All right, then let's thank our speakers.